Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York Times senior editor Charles Duhigg and panelists William Bratton and Dr. Margaret Hamburg. Thank you so much. Th oh, thanks for joining us today as I drop things off the stage. Um, and let me start just by thanking and introducing you to our, our panelists today. Um, Peggy Hamburg, until recently this year and appointed in 2009, was the commissioner of the Fed Food and Drug Administration. And previous to that, um, under Mayor Dinkins, was the health commissioner for New York City, where she served with um, Commissioner Bratton, who, of course, today is the commissioner of the, of the New York Police Department. This is actually his second trip through the, uh, the department. He was there under uh, Mayor Giuliani as well and had served as commissioner in Los Angeles and Boston, basically any big city that had crime, I think at some point you were there. And let me start by asking about that. We're, we're going to be talking today about big data. Um, and it, this is particularly germane to have um, these folks on the stage with me because we are, are, are living in an age of infatuation with big data, obviously. There's a huge conversation around using big data. And in many ways, you can trace that back to when Commissioner Bratton first took over the New York City Police Force and brought in CompStat, using data-driven metrics and management to look at policing issues, look at crime, and try and, and solve it. Now, that's been a huge success, and, and there's been a number of um, laurels thrown your way because of the success of CompStat. It's spread around the country. In the intervening 20 years, there's also emerged uh, question whether we be have become over-infatuated with big data, whether we are over-relying. Other police systems, other police, um, other cities that use CompStat have been criticized for having cops that focus too much on the numbers, on trying to only undertake a short-term focus. Oh, and and some, some have argued that under um, the current administration, the previous administration, that CompStat and data-driven focus is what led to stop, question, and frisk, which obviously has its critics. So let me ask you this, Commissioner. Um, given that, that you rightfully get a lot of the, the praise for CompStat and for data thinking, do you also deserve some of the blame for some of the problems that we have when data is being overused now? Well, I don't think it's actually being overused. Uh, we are constantly trying to find ways to use it more efficiently and effectively. The CompStat process that was developed in 94 here in New York City actually began with flip charts and plastic acetate and little pushpins that hotspot policing was called. And then with the beginning of the uh, computerization of our crime stats, we were able to compile much larger amounts of information, analyze it more quickly, and respond more quickly to developing patterns and trends. In two weeks, we will be uh, going to CompStat 2 in the NYPD, in which the whole process will be totally computerized, so that my cop in the street with his smartphone, my precinct uh, commander sitting at his desk with his uh, uh, one of the 35,000 computers we just installed, will have the ability instantly to draw up phenomenal amounts of information, collate it, analyze it, so that the ability to identify emerging patterns and trends will be much faster. We're also uh, experimenting and quite successfully with the next phase of American policing that we will be leading, and that's predictive policing. Once again, data mining, huge amounts of information, but developing algorithms that will effectively mine that data in a way that the human brain cannot in many different directions. So uh, big data is here to stay, and it's going to be something that's going to be part and parcel of policing. Are uh, there negatives with it? Uh, certainly. That, uh, is there the risk of intrusiveness? Certainly. But uh, there is a controlling element in law enforcement, and that's the law. And that uh, the law is something that we assiduously uh, work to stay within. I have one of the largest law firms uh, uh, in New York City, in the NYPD, and they constantly work to keep us out of trouble <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> How's it going? Is it, is it working out? So far, pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, well, well I, so this is a great, uh, because I think in many ways the conversation about big data when it comes to cities and resiliency is about these two sides of the coin. And, and in policing, it's somewhat more stark than it is in public health, but certainly in public health we've seen this issue. Uh, as Commissioner of FDA, you saw this a number of times. I mean, uh, you, you described to me when you were so talking on the phone the other day as um, CompStat as, as public health applied to policing, because a lot of what we know about, about looking at populations, about using data to see patterns that are invisible comes from public health. But one of the things that, you, that you've learned as FDA commissioner is that sometimes the public sees a clarity there 
that, of course, scientists don't. I was wondering, t tell us a little bit about your experiences with Ebola and with Atavast. Am I pronouncing it? Avastin. Avastin. Because those were situations in which the data was cloudy for you, but people wanted clear answers, right? Well, I think two things. One, let me step back and just say that I think the way to find meaningful solutions that will really make a difference is to look at data, not just to expect that the more data you collect, automatically answers will fall out, though. You have to know what you're looking for, how to collect the data properly, know that the data is reliable, and then use that data to implement um, the kinds of solutions that will work and that will matter. And you know whether it's in the context of policing the streets or controlling disease, uh, targeting resources uh, in any number of areas, you know, this is an incredibly important framework, and I actually think it is goes back to the very core of public health. Public health was doing this decades, centuries ago, going back maybe to the days of John Snow and the Broad Street Pump, when he figured out that cholera wasn't happening because of miasma, something bad in the air, but he was able to collect data to show that it, it was all the cases were coming from the Broad Street pump in Soho in London, that if you took the handle off the pump because the water was contaminated, uh, you could control disease and save hundreds, thousands lives. Um, you know, with respect to you know, the role I had at the FDA, the problem is that you have to make decisions for populations when people are different. And so, um, you look at the overall data about the safety and effectiveness of a medical product, um, and you have to, to weigh the risks and benefits overall and make decisions about uh, if this is a product that should be used for an indicated purpose. Um, you mentioned, you know, with Ebola, for example, many people thought when the Ebola outbreak was raging, and it still is going on, but it is you know, increasingly coming under control. But at, at its peak, people were so concerned, so worried, they felt that anything would be better than the situation at hand. And there were some experimental vaccines. There were experimental drugs. Um, and FDA was under a lot of pressure, as were healthcare providers, governments, and others, to do the best job possible, and there were huge fights and a lot of contentiousness within the public health community, the medical community, and uh, within uh, NGOs taking care of Ebola patients, and the governments in West Africa and other countries involved in the response about what was the right thing to do, and do you, do you put these drugs out there, these vaccines out there, try to collect information as you go and see if it makes a difference or do you study it, even though it's gonna take time to better understand the risks and benefits before you put it out there for broader use. And it's, and it's tough. It's a complicated question. I mean, I think, that, I think that this gets to the heart of, I don't think anyone in this room, and if you do disagree, let me know. Anyone in this room would disagree that, oh, by the way, anyone have Ebola in the room? <laughs> Good, okay. That, that data, big data, using data has sophisticated, has improved lives. But there does seem to be this public image right now of data as offering a magic bullet, a solution. And the solution always seems pure and clean, whether it's that a Ebola drug works or doesn't work, whether it's that a particular type of um, crime fighting is effective or ineffective. Uh, let me just ask, you know, for folks in this room, how many of you have ever had your identity stolen or an account hacked into something that you feel like um, where uh, information was gleaned by, by an Okay, a number of people, a number of people. And, and I think if I was to ask uh, how many of us in this room, um, is there some piece of data inside the federal government or the New York police system that might indicate who we are and some of our proclivities or preferences, my guess is everyone in this room would raise their hand. And so let me ask this question. I mean, let's take as a given that data breaches are going to happen, right? They just stole uh, background reports from the White House, and as far as we know, is launched Inclu by- Including uh, mine. Including not, yours. Not just Inclu the White House, all of government. All of government, yeah, right. Yeah, so anyone who ever <laughs> handed over their mother's maiden name and their social security number, they now know what your password is. Perhaps um, someone working for the Chinese state knows. Which means that as a result, they could probably get access to our email accounts. And I'm assuming, how many people in this room, if I could get access to your email account, think that I could find something to um, gently blackmail you with? 
to uh, <laughs> a couple of us, right? <laughs> we have cameras on you. We'll, we'll follow up later. So let me ask you this. Given this issue, what, to sh what should we be communicating to residents of cities about what data can and can't do and about the risks that are inherent in the data collection that's going on right now? I think the biggest thing to communicate is that uh, there are no secrets. There are none. That uh, uh, if two people uh, share a piece of information, it is no longer a secret. And whether you want that second person to know that information or not, the likelihood is that there's a good chance that they're going to get it, as we just saw with the uh, Chinese government hacking of the uh, top secret uh, personnel profiles. Uh, no, the world we're living in, 21st century, uh, uh, I think of that movie Moonstruck with Cher where she slaps the uh, boyfriend, get over it. Get over it, it's here. That, uh, <laughs> in, in, in 1994, when I created, uh, in response to this new thing that we were starting to experience, identity theft, that I created the first computer crime unit in the NYPD, 10 detectives. This past year, I just created a, a cybercrime financial theft unit, 250 detectives, because of the magnitude of the cybercrime problem in this city. So we've gotten over it, that it's, uh, we're gonna have to put resources there, and we're gonna have to understand the vulnerabilities and the strengths, the vulnerabilities and the strengths. The strengths are, as the, uh, the good, good doctor referenced, uh, is that if you have reliable data, there is so much that you can do. The audience might be wondering why is police and health on the same stage? Well, in many respects, we are literally joined at the hip with around the issue of data. As hospitals this past several months have been reporting a significant increase in overdoses with synthetic marijuana, K2 as we call it, we the police have been experiencing a phenomenal rise in extraordinarily emotionally disturbed individuals with superhuman strength being affected by this particular drug. So it is a health crisis that is quickly morphed into a police crisis. In so many of the instances in which I've moved forward using data, we use a health model where we are gathering large amounts of information to start to drill down to what is draining the swamp to get rid of mosquitoes, solve the malaria problem, versus swatting at mosquitoes. So like health, we try to get to the source of the problem. To do it, we need large amounts of information, but we need reliable information. That's why I came down so hard on the 4-0 precinct that was so much in the news the last couple of days. I cannot have anybody in my organization purposely reporting unreliable data because I make resource allocation decisions that are life and death based on that information. So we assiduously work on that data. It has to be reliable first and foremost. And you know, I think it's an it's a age-old challenge about balancing civil liberties and the common good you know, when they all align, terrific, but often there are tensions, and that certainly, you know, is very true of public health. And reflecting back, especially sitting here with my former colleague, Commissioner Bratton, on my time in New York City, tuberculosis is a great example of that, where um, individuals have tuberculosis and transmit it, but you can't know if there's someone in this room with active infectious tuberculosis. And so if that individual's tuberculosis isn't controlled, everyone potentially gets put at risk. And while we were working together in New York City, um, you know, we, I had just become commissioner, I, I looked at the data that was sitting in the health department and saw that there were very serious pockets of tuberculosis, particularly in the poorest neighborhoods of New York City, and it wasn't being adequately addressed. And the reason was that everybody was focused on the, the terrible, devastating epidemic of HIV. Um, and that was getting all the attention. But the data was there for TB, and in fact, TB and HIV were very linked because you're more likely to be susceptible to TB and to, to actually then become an incubator for spread if you're immune compromised like with HIV. So looking at the data and acting on the data was key to actually and getting it. And I wanna control. ask you that in a, in a second. Let me ask about acting on the data, but before I do, is it fair for me to take away from what you're saying then that in a contemporary world, it, giving, uh, sacrificing some aspects of our privacy is the cost of living in a society where we can recognize TB the same way that we force people to get vaccines because we want herd, men, uh, herd immunity, that we force people to feed into a system where you might lose some of your privacy, you might be a victim of, of identity theft. 
but because the greater good is served. Is that, is that a, the world that we're living in? It's a critical balance. I think, you know, public understanding is key to success, but at the end of the day, you know, I do think that, that getting to a place where we can really understand the public good is essential uh, if we're going to live, in particular, if we're going to live in big urban settings, which is increasingly the case. I think that's here totally fair. And let me ask a question about that. I, I, some of the, the critics of what's going on right now, the particularly uh, Commissioner, sorry, there's a fly. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't have West Nile. I, um, I don't know if I can do an <laughs> Obama. And, you know. <laughs> if you do, you get to become president right away. Um, the, the commissioner, obviously under um, uh, Mayor, Brat or Mayor um, de Blasio's uh, predecessor, Mayor Bloomberg, very data-driven administration. There was a, quite a bit of criticism towards the end of the administration towards some of the policing efforts, stop, question, and frisk. De Blasio came into office uh, p positioning himself as at least a critic, if not a foe, of using data-driven approaches solely to, to make decisions. What, how do you handle this tension that, that data-driven management on its own oftentimes pushes us two solutions that look racially insensitive, that look socioeconomically insensitive. What should cops be doing, or public health advocates, to, to make sure that the data doesn't push them into prejudice? Two, two thoughts around the stop, question, frisk issue. That, and I'll use the medical uh, uh, comparison. You go to a doctor, uh, he determines that uh, you have an illness and uh, cancer. He's going to treat you with a regimen, radiation, maybe surgery, chemotherapy. Similarly, in policing, we determine that there's an illness, and we're going to use a degree of medicine to treat that. And over the last 20 years, we've been very effective treating the illness of crime in the city. It's down 80%. Quality of life enforcement is a critical portion of that, because in addition to treating the cancer, you have to treat many of the other side effects, and quality of life enforcement is a side effect, as well as dealing with a serious crime. I think the mistake that was made by the previous administration that the mayor campaigned on, that every mayor campaigned on, was that the patient had gotten better and was saying to the doctor, particularly the black community, the minority community, why are you still giving me so much chemo and radiation when I'm better? Crime is down 80%, but the dose keeps going up from high 500,000, 600,000, 700,000. So what the mayor politically and what I, uh, from a, a police standpoint, argued was that you could lower the dose of medicine dramatically and not have a negative impact on the patient's health. It isn't that, in fact, what is happening. Stop, question, and frisk is now probably fewer than 50,000 documented. We're pushing now because we think some of our offices aren't documenting when they're supposed to, but even if that's a 10 or 20% range, it is down phenomenally. Has crime gone up in the city? Not, not at all. Last year was the safest year in the history of the city. Safest year for homicides, second safest year for shootings. Even this year, with the summer increase that we always get, this is still our third best shooting year and I think our second best homicide year in history with a much less use of radiation. So there's that matchup between medicine and policing and it's all about reliable data in terms of that because the public wants to have accurate information about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they just felt with stop, question, and frisk that they weren't being given reliable uh, data. So let me ask you about a, a program that you mentioned before, your predictive analytics, predicting. To, to this end, that we know that whether it's radiation or whether it's policing, that there is a process of finding the right dosage and that we, over, mm -hmm. we go over and we go under until we find it. They, I think for many people, they hear predictive um, analytics on policing and they think, oh, th you know, this is like some future sci-fi thing, right, where you start choosing who's going to be the criminal before they actually commit the crime. We're, we're prejudging in a, in a sense and, and, and no, making choices. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we don't uh, – explain how the system works and how mm -hmm. the protection's in place so two, that it doesn't two, two quick overstep. examples, one contemporary and one a few years ago in Chicago. Uh, predictive policing, think Tom Cruise minority report back in 2002, how out of uh, – Unreal that scene with him waving his hand on that shot. We, I can do that in my office now. That predictive policing is really the ability with the right algorithms that we can predict with a high degree of certainty, increasing certainty, that in a geographic area, in a certain time frame, absent putting a police officer in there, that a crime will likely occur. And is it perfect? No, but increasingly we're seeing as we experiment with it, as the algorithms get better, as the amount of data that we accumulate gets better. 
That is the world we're going, and it's largely how medicine tends to work. Medicine is largely predictive of how do, you, how do you predict where the flu is going to come this year, what strain of flu, et cetera. That's all algorithms with a lot of information. Going back to uh, Chicago a few years ago, the school superintendent at that time uh, identified 500 kids in that city that in all likelihood, if there was not intervention, that they were going to be the victim or the murder that in all likelihood because of who they were, black, their age range, the schools they were in, the neighborhoods they came out of, their unemployment situation, their family situation, that there was a high degree of comfort that these 500 young men were at phenomenal risk of being murdered in Chicago. And they began a whole series of interventions. They relocated families out of di different neighborhoods, relocated them out of different schools. So there was a form of uh, effectively public health because Policing, crime is a public health crisis. Somebody gets shot, they're going into a hospital, and then they become a significant burden on society. They're paralyzed for the rest of their life, the thousands of dollars spent on basically saving their lives. So predictive policing is, uh, we are uh, embracing it wholeheartedly. I've got a couple of experiments underway. I'm also, unfortunately, I've got a young man who works in my department that's uh, just brilliant in this area. And uh, it is the wave of the future that that minority report of 2002 is the reality of today. And when I'm talking about uh, predictive policing, that's going to be the reality in the next couple of years in policing in this city and around the country. Commissioner Hamburg, given that that's true, public health officials are going to be at the tip of the sword of explaining to the public how to make sense of the strengths and weaknesses of data, of the certainty of the types of predictive analytics or predictive policing or predictive health forecasting. What do the leaders in this room, the leaders of cities need to know about how we communicate and sophisticate populations' understanding of the strengths and limitations of data? Well, I think we're all in it together, but public health is very, very key. And I think many of the tools of public health that have developed over time you know, have become the tools of ComStat and other things in terms of how you collect data, um, how you do the, the epidemiologic analysis of what does the data show and the importance of you know, really being able to uh, both assess the quality of the input and the goals of the output because you know, data analysis is not enough if you don't act on it. So you have to have the whole spectrum. Um, you know, from my perspective, based on both my experience in New York City, um, working in the Clinton administration as the Assistant Secretary for um, Planning um, and Evaluation, and then of course as FDA Commissioner, you know, the critical thing is the ability to work in partnership with the public you serve. And the, 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 in medicine and public health today, that's more important than ever because we are moving not just into the era of big data, but that involves personalized medicine and really digging down to what is most fundamental about you, which is your, your very DNA, genomics, and understanding you know, the, your makeup, the makeup of your disease, um, and how best to target interventions and treatments. So that is very intrusive in many ways, but the ability to benefit you and society more broadly in terms of improved health and hopefully prevention is enormous. At the same time, we can't forget the fundamentals, which is the, the close relationship to health, well-being, and safety to the broader environment. And in a discussion focused on urban issues, you know, we have to recognize that the urban environment is one where there are huge benefits to bring effective solutions to people and to populations, but also where you have the possibility of rapid exacerbation of problems because of the confluence of people if you don't pay attention. And that's where I think, you know, paying attention to the data, knowing where the problems are, targeting interventions, and making sure that we're thinking long term as well as short term is important as well. Because you can miss the Absolutely. boat if you only focus Absolutely. on today and tomorrow's problems. Let, let, let's take just a couple of questions. We have just a couple of minutes. To, um, if anyone has a question, feel free to send that to Q at NY Times or to raise your hand. Um, let me uh, just, um, Commissioner uh, George actually said that Cher said snap out of it, not get over it in the movie. So. But there was a famous get over it on this <laughs> there, same there topic was, uh, there was from something. some leader there was in the tech we, community. We won't hold yeah. it against you. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, One of my favorite movies. I'm very chagrined that I. <laughs> <laughs> And, and now you know what his password is for his Gmail account. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so Ann, Ann Farrell had asked, um, how, how can we better leverage big data to address the social needs of communities and to measure the effects of social programs? And in doing so, how can we address the concerns about privacy? We want to use big data ha to help the, the most vulnerable, but obviously the most vulnerable are also at risk for the greatest predation. That's a great question because actually city government right now, we are in the midst of doing just that. Uh, uh, collaborating various city agencies. I, I, I would argue there's probably never been a time where there's as much collaboration between city agencies as I'm seeing now, much more so than I experienced in 94 when I was here the last time. And so the issue, that question, that the idea is looking at what is the impact, particularly in those areas that are the most distressed, public housing, high unemployment, high number of parolees living in the environment, schools that rate the lowest, all of these clouds, if you will, over certain hot spots. How uh, is the impact of what I'm doing policing going to impact on the medical aspect of the city government? Uh, all of the various entities that work on these issues, how can we better work together exchanging information so we can see in a collaborative uh, way, can we have more significant impact than working individually on our particular problem, minus the crime problem, the schools, the ed educating children, health and hospitals working on issues of uh, 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 health in those areas. So the city government is actually moving toward the idea of trying to match up all of this big data so that we can all benefit from the collaboration that we can put into one neighborhood with all of us working on the multiplicity of issues there. Well, and this actually gets to another question that, that I'll ask, but given that I anytime you have a hammer and that hammer gets more and more powerful, you need people to look more like the nails that the hammer can hit. We know that, that people at the lower end of the economic spectrum, that they t tend to generate less data, right? They're less, they're less, um, they're less, they're on the internet less. They tend to have less financial instruments that generate data that allow us to link to them. Are we concerned that a lot of our solutions are becoming designed for people who fit best into the data generation model and that those people who don't generate as much data, that they're getting lost in the cracks? Uh, I, they're, different, they're generating a different type of data that's important to deal with their issues. They're generating, certainly, unfortunately for them, crime data. They're generating 311 call data, 911 call data that is very instrumental in us in the medical profession, understanding what's going on in that neighborhood. They're certainly de uh, uh, generating medical data in the sense of their use of city hospital services, more so than others who might have the opportunity to go to private uh, doctors, et cetera. No, that uh, uh, there are huge amounts of data coming from every population, and that data, I would argue, is reflective of their particular need. So it's, uh, it's, it's I, I could not police the city without having that data generated from 911 calls, 311 calls, watching very closely medical admissions to spot early on that in certain areas, the Bronx, for example, I've got this, uh, I'm up in Manhattan, we've got two areas of the city where we're having this K2 problem. And a lot of that is being generated from admissions to hospitals That's for overdose in those two areas of the city. So early on, we understood that there was a growing crime problem because of the growing medical problem. That's interesting. Let me, t let me take one more question. Is it, does anyone from the audience, we have a, a mic runner, if, uh, y yeah, over here, if you don't mind coming down. Hi. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how data is being used by government. What do you think, how can data be given to citizens uh, to better improve their lives? Well, in the medical public health area, there is you know, a huge appreciation now of people wanting more information. It used to be, you know, when I was in medical training, which sadly was quite a long time ago now, you know, the, the patient's chart was sort of not something that was accessible easily to the patient and you know the doctor knew best kind of and now it is a much more open system and of course people are going on the internet also and and getting information for for government you know there is a lot of data collected um, as well in the health field and in other areas um, and you know in theory it's it's accessible to you, but sometimes you have to be pretty sophisticated to navigate the systems and put in the requests and wait and wait and wait and then you know know whether you're getting what you need, et cetera. But there is 
an increasing emphasis on the fact that patients want to know that systems need to be created to, to make that information available, um, including information that you know, some people worry about in terms of are patients going to be ready to handle the information, and that's been a big discussion in the genetics area about diagnostics and genetic information. But I think you know, the overriding sense as the, the field moves forward is that, that, that the patient is at the center of the work, the patient needs all the information, and that we have a big job as a nation, um, as a global society, to, to improve understanding scientific literacy and access to information so that better decisions can be made. So, so one more, just because we're talking about resiliency today, just very quickly, um, and this is a question that came from Jose, is given if, if we had a disaster in New York, what are we doing to make sure that the data that, that the nation and the city relies on um, remains preserved in the case of uh, some unthinkable act, natural or in unnatural? Well, I can't speak for the federal government, but in terms of within our city, working with our various entities responsible for that, certainly the data I depend on within the police department, that we're continually trying to improve our defenses in the sense of as much as we want to be as transparent and collaborative with sharing information, there's certain information that we can't share. So we spend a lot of time, a lot of time and effort and money, both police department, but working in collaboration with the city entities responsible for the city's information, trying to protect that both in the sense of from the typical uh, cyber attacks that uh, whether they be criminal or espionage focused, but also in a disaster so that you have redundancy. So for example, we'll have soon shortly two 911 centers in two very different areas of the city so that we don't lose everything if one facility were to go down. Similarly, in terms of where you store your information, we have a major uh, effort underway to effectively uh, make very redundant all of our data files that in the event we will lose a center, whether through a natural disaster or an attack, so there's a we've backup. got redundant files. Much well, the same as you back up your computers, hopefully, all the time. Thank you all for, for your time. I, I think going forward, next time you get your um, identity stolen, you can tell <laughs> the person on the phone that you understand this was needed for the health of the country, <laughs> that you are unfortunately the one person who got the virus or perhaps the million people who got the virus. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us today. Thank you for your questions. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. Thank you. Thank you all.